Hi my friends, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to a fresh episode of the Premier League Show And today we've got a wrap up week 10 of the Premier League 10 weeks of fixtures done and dusted and this is where the teams start to get a feel Where the clubs are going to sort of end up, what they're fighting for in the league And I feel like we learned quite a lot from this week's fixtures Now before we crack on with today's episode, ladies and gentlemen I do want to apologise for this going out a little later than it usually would I needed to fit FIFA in and I just didn't really have the time what with Monday night football and everything else but it's going out right now tomorrow my friends keep your eyes peeled though for the preview for week 11 it's going to be a good one and we will talk through all of that good gravy brilliant stuff descriptive words are abandoning me right now but let's crack on we've got plenty to run through it's going to be a quick one though let's wrap up week 10 of the Premier League. Hi guys, so we're going to start this wrap up as we always do. Key talking points and I think that we've got two really that I want to cover um, and then we'll run through the rest of the fixtures as we usually do. My absolute legends, homies, one and onlys. Uh, so yeah, the big talking points I think to come out of this weekend worth of football is what the fuck is happening at Everton Football Club. We are going to discuss that first and foremost. Um, a disappointing loss for them once again again and considering where they were setting up the beginning of the year it's not looking good also I want to quickly touch upon Manchester United's win against Tottenham I think that's a massive result as far as the Premier League is concerned uh, Tottenham were a team that were looking really really good but Manchester United have pulled one out of the bag and it, an excellent result for them so uh, and then after that wrapping up the rest of the game so let's crack on let's talk about the game Leicester versus Everton. Um, I think if we're taking this game as a whole, you know, I sat and watched this one. I, th I think it was a good result for uh, Leicester. It tends to happen, though. Every time Leicester appoint a new manager, it's as if a rocket stuck out their arse, lit, and often a moon, <clears throat> nice firework display, and a win. It's just what happens at Leicester. It happened when Ranieri was there, and then after he went, Shakespeare come in. They went on a run with Shakespeare. The caretaker manager got one, and then Carl, uh, then Poirot's come in, Claude Poirot's come in, and he gets an opening weekend win, and they looked really good as well, Leicester. We can't take anything away from them. Damari Gray was unbelievable up the wing. You can see why the lad has been asking for a chance as well. He's been been just pleading for it, begging for it, does get a chance, and he was excellent against Everton, destroyed him on that right side, was involved in both goals, um, you know, Vardy looked good, Everton couldn't deal with the pace, they were well organised in the midfield, did well at the back, they basically did everything you want your football club to do in a home fixture, make that home, you know, ground a fortress as well, a great result for Leicester, we don't really need to say any more, I just thought I'd get out of the way first before we crack on with, you know, Everton, and really, you know, a lot of people this week in the press, you know, Phil Neville come out, and they've all been pleading for David Unsworth to get the job. Now, I ain't being funny. I know we can't really base it on one performance. We can't judge him off the back of that. You know, he's come in in a difficult time, a difficult position where, you know, Everton um, have just let their manager go. There's no confidence in the squad. They lost in the cup. You know, it's not a good. It's not a good time to come in there and try and you know stamp your ideas and take on that job. But he, I don't think he did himself any favors in this fixture. Everton in that first 20, 25 minutes were torn to shreds by Leicester's speed. There was no organisation at the back. They, you know, at points in the game, they started to come back into it. We, There is an argument that there was a blatant penalty, you know, turned down by the referee. Um, what Fuchs was doing, bringing Aaron Lennon down the way he did, I don't know. But for Aaron Lennon then to be dragged off in the manner that he was, I believe, half-time, just not good enough. Everton did create chances, but at no point in that game did you look at that Everton team and feel like they were playing as a team, playing as a unit, and were going to come away with a win in the fixture. £150 million pounds spent in the summer, and it's just not good enough at Everton, I'm afraid. Um... You know, they didn't buy in the area that they needed to most. They didn't buy up top. They didn't replace Lukaku. And I honestly think that's the biggest reason why Everton are struggling this season as a whole. Wayne Rooney is not a number nine. He's not an out-and-out -out striker. He's a number 10. He can't be expected to go there at this point in his career and score the goals for him and do everything for him. You know, if anything, Rooney was one of the better players on the day for ever, and they just look a very, very disappointing football club. I think they're probably going to be one of those clubs at the end of the season that cost a few people in this world money on Ackers because... Beginning of the season, I had them as one of them teams on, on the brink, maybe even cracking on and reaching the dizzy heights of the top six. 
Because I felt like they did a good enough job, but you know, it hasn't worked out for Koeman. He loses his job. It's not working out for Unsworth. I think they bought completely wrong on the base of it now and it's just not looking very good and I just don't know when Everton are going to turn a corner. Uh, I know that my lot have got them soon, that'll probably be it because we like to give results to teams as we're going to talk about shortly um, but yeah, it's not very good is it at Everton um, work needs to be done, I feel like you know, if Unsworth isn't going to be given the job, then someone needs bringing in, you know, very very quickly and a, and a name. I know Sean Dyche is being linked is that a big enough name? I know he's doing a good job at Burnley, but is that the sort of name Everton really require at this moment in time? But they're in the bottom three. It's not looking good. Now, let's move on. Let's crack on to Manchester United versus Spurs. Man, you come away with a victory. I felt that like the game was pretty balanced in the first half. I felt like both teams didn't really create much, but they were playing for each other, uh, playing, play, you know, kind of cancelling each other out the game. Sorry is what I meant to say. Um... Second half, Manchester United come into it. Weirdly, they made a couple of changes and it worked in their favour. Um, Martial obviously coming up with a goal in the end. It was the most root one goal you're probably going to see, other than the Antonio one for West Ham you know, a week or so ago. Very root one goal. Um, you, very un-Tottenham, the defending, the marking and all that in the, uh, you know, for the goal. On the base of play, I think Manchester United you know, deserved the win. I think they were... And, you know, I think they just edged it. I think Mourinho got it spot on as far as the defence is concerned. Um, the defence did a great job. I think they were pretty compact in midfield. They did, they created chances, not many. But Mourinho is a genius at, you know, nicking a goal and then, you know, that's it. We'll, we'll take that. That's a victory. That's all we need, three points. And at the end of the day, you can't knock him for it because that really is the case. That's how football works. But, you know, I think the big talking points that come out of the game is our, our Spurs... Uh, too heavily dependent on Harry Kane. Now, obviously, he missed the game. He, he picked up a slight hamstring injury, um, you know, uh, in the previous weekend's worth of football. And they missed him up front. They didn't really have an outlet. Son couldn't get going, you know, couldn't use his pace, which I was quite surprised at. You know, and all the other options they tried there didn't quite work for him. Um, obviously, Kane is, you know, a different weapon. He makes them tick a different way. But can they be labelled a one-man team? I don't think they can. I think they've got plenty of players in there that could do a job. I think against another team, maybe Spurs win. I think they created enough chances. Just against a very good unit like Manchester United, well drilled under Jose Mourinho, they found it difficult. But it is an interesting talking point to take forward. Um, you know, can they afford to be without Kane for long periods of the season? I'm sure we will find out if he does pick up any little niggles as the season goes on. But let's talk about the rest of the fixtures now, my friends. We're going to quickly run through them as quick as possible anyway. And uh, first up, we're going to talk about Manchester City versus West, West, uh, versus West Bromwich Albion even. Jesus, can I get the words out of my big old mouth? 3-2 um, it finished Manchester City dominated the fixture yet still let in two goals against the struggling West Bromwich Albion team now before we talk about Manchester City West Bromwich Albion haven't won in eight games now they started the season electric two wins you know really really good looking solid and then since then it has all gone downhill and it's not looking good I don't really see where they're going to get their you know their next win um it's a bit of a worry for West Bromwich Albion, in my opinion, um, at the moment. Uh, because they don't really have anyone, you know... I know they got a couple of goals in this, but other than this game, they don't really have anyone scoring consistently. That was their problem last year, the year before... And it continues to be a problem. They share the goals far too much. They need a striker, in my opinion. I think everyone else has bought very, very well. West Bromwich Albion, you know, they spent some money, bought in some good players, but it hasn't quite worked for them just yet. Saying all that, though, competitive against a Manchester City team. This is a Man City team that are tearing teams to shreds. Now, Manchester City, off the back of this win, have had the best start to a Premier League season than any team in the history of the Premier League. To take 28 points from your first 10 games, that's a record for the blue team of Manchester and you know they thoroughly deserve it they're playing some unbelievable stuff they could have blown West Bromwich Albion away in this fixture if it hadn't been for West Brom's defence and goalkeeper but three goals another three points a delicious result for them they're still five clear of Manchester United I believe at the top of the table great result for them uh, next up Watford were defeated by Stoke in what I have considered 
one of the shock results of the weekend. I had West, uh, Watford winning this one all day long, but Stoke went there with a flat back five. It did a job, nicked the goal, they nicked the result. They were... You know, both teams competitive. Stoke with a better team, in my opinion. Uh, the big talking points come out of this game is that Troy Deeney lost his call, was a little bit naughty in the fixture, and could face backlash from the FA. The incident's being reviewed, and in my opinion, he probably deserves a couple of games banned at least. Silly, silly boy, considering he's just got himself back in the team, started to play some good football, but Troy Deeney's one of them. He's got a bit of a tempo, he's got a bit of a hot head, hasn't he? And could really be costing himself a few weeks of football for Watford. A disappointing loss for Watford, I'm sure they will agree, and I'm sure the fans will agree as well, because this is a Stoke team that had really, really been struggling Weren't expected to win away from home, but they go away from home, you know, get the win. Imp and impressively, they defend, they do well, and it's three points. They're not going to grumble. Uh, next up, Liverpool did defeat Huddersfield by three goals to nil. Liverpool found it really difficult in the first half. Missed a penalty for uh, Salah as well. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until the second half they really started to get going. And, uh, you know, they moved forward, you know, in the game. I had something on my tongue, I apologise for that. Um, yeah, and they really started to get going in the game, you know, um, and then they took the three points, you know, they turned the style on. Um, it's a little worrying when you watch Liverpool going forward. My mob have got them this coming week, and uh, they really are electric at times uh, going forward. They managed to keep a clean sheet. That's that's probably more important than the three goals scored if you're a Liverpool fan or even part of the management team there because they just don't keep many clean sheets they're not very good at the back and uh but this time out they were good well organized did a good job i'm not going to talk too much about huddersfield for a newly promoted team to come up against one of those in the top six you sweep this one under the rug and you just say this stuff happens this is the premier league they are better than us and it's just going to happen the fact it only finished three nil is that's, that's a positive for Huddersfield, in my opinion. You just sweep this one under the rug, move on to the next week, as we now move on to the next fixture. And I've got to talk about West Ham now, and I don't want to. I'm doing a Premier League uh, preview for Liverpool uh, later tonight, um, at the time of recording this. Uh, it is Tuesday, I believe. I'm doing the preview with them, and I've got to talk about fucking West Ham then. And I don't really want to talk about us, because how a team can go 2-0 up and then come out in the second half and be so naive and so disrespectful to an opponent to not show up and not do a job is beyond me. A lot of people have been giving Antonio a hell of a lot of stick. He did a great job taking it in the corner and then what he was thinking, crossing the ball in the box like he was, it pains me, is, is idiotic. Yes, he is at fault for some of it, but the whole team's at fault for letting a two lead, a two goal lead, you know, slip. It's as simple as that, and it's not good enough. It really isn't good enough. I think Billich has had more than enough chances now. They were never going to sack him off the back of a draw, but for me, I would have. That's fourteen wins in the last fifty odd games. We've conceded ninety odd goals in them, and it's shit. It's it's so so bad. There's no bottle in that team. They can't grind out results. And it was just typical of West Ham to go and beat Spurs midweek in the Cup and then be defeated by the worst team in the league. I was sitting here in the preview and I was saying, why do we need to talk about Crystal Palace? They're shit. Credit, where credit is due, Crystal Palace really turned it on in that second half. And they fought to the final fucking whistle, the 97th minute. That went in, that goal. Fair play to Crystal Palace for taking the point. But disappointment again from West Ham. It's not good enough. Bilic has to go. And the team need a major fucking wake up. Because if they don't, we are going down. We are in a relegation fight. If there's any West Ham fans watching this, do not be kidded. We are. In our next seven games, we face Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal and City. We are struggling. We're in trouble, my friends. Let's move on. Let's not talk about that anymore. Arsenal beat Swansea by two goals to one. Swansea went 1 0 up. They and it was against the run of play from what I have listened to when I was because this was one of the games I didn't catch on match of the day and I completely forgot to record it. Um, 
but they went 1-0 up, completely against the run of play. They had another chance where they could have gone 2-0 up, but Arsenal come out victors in the end. I don't know what it is about Arsenal this season, but they seem to want to make hard work of every single fucking game that they play in. Their fans are going through it. You know, this is a big club, Arsenal. They should be competing for the Premier League, but too many times they make the easy games hard for themselves. Well, some could argue that City did that, but even when City have conceded two goals against West Bromwich Albion. They look comfortable. They look comfortable at beating them. You know, they, they it, City at the moment, for me, they feel like if they concede a goal, they take that as a real fucking piece of disrespect to them. Arsenal don't. They almost lay down and want their belly tickled and want it all to be over. And they accept defeat too many times. But fair play, they did fight in the result. They did come back, but they are making hard work of it for themselves. They really don't need to be. You know, it, Arsenal for me... This needs to be a platform of some consistency. They've got a massive game coming up at the weekend, you know, in week 11, which we're going to talk about. It's, it's going to be one of my games of the week. And they need to get a run of results together. That, that game coming up, is the, they're the sorts of games they're going to be judged on. That's where we need a performance from Arsenal. But this was a good win. It's a starting point because they've been stumbling this season, you know, in and out, in and out. Too many points dropped already, but good to come back for them. Bournemouth were defeated by Chelsea in a game that really didn't, you know, it didn't light the world up, did it, my friends? Bournemouth made it difficult for Chelsea, but Chelsea come away with the 1-0 victory. And for now, Antonio Conte is safe in that job. And it's almost silly saying that, doesn't it? Because, you know, they're in the top four, but he's not happy there. And I don't think that, you know, the chairman's too happy with him, with his comments and the way that he's been acting recently. Um... But a win's a win. You know, I'd have Antonio Conte in a fucking heartbeat at West Ham. He'd get jobs done. You know, they're good in defence. They're a well-drilled machine. Rudiger was exceptional for them as well at the back in this fixture. Really, really started to come into his own in this one. I'd been a little disappointed with him this season. He had been played out of position somewhat. Uh, Asper Laqueta was excellent as well. A good win for them. And Bournemouth, what can we say about Bournemouth? Another team that are continuing to struggle this season. They are going to have to do some business in January if they want to get anything from the season. Brighton and Southampton shared out a 1-1 draw. And I think you know, we can all say that's a great result for uh, Brighton in this fixture for me. Um, I think that, you know, Southampton were on top in that first half. Brighton really come into it into the second half, though. And, you know, Florida deserved the point in the end. You know, Brighton are starting to show they're quite a stubborn team. They're quite a hard team to beat. You know, all the men know their job. You know, they, they did very well against my lot. They battered us. To come back in it in the fashion they did and, you know, fashion more chances and play in the fashion and, you know, play play how they did. It's a really, really good point for them. And I'm really sorry about the barking in the background. It is, you know, at the time of recording this, the 31st, it's Halloween with all the dickheads fucking knocking on the door and the dogs are losing their temper. And the last game we have to talk about, my friends, let's wrap this up before my dogs really lose their shit, is... Burnley versus Newcastle. It finished 1-0. Sean Dyche with another three points. An impressive game. A present victory for him again. Newcastle didn't really, you know, show up. I think Newcastle's biggest problem, and they sum this up as well on Sky Sports, is, is it's at the top of the pitch. They need goals, and I think they need to spend some money in January. If they do that, they will continue to do well. I think all the newly promoted teams, though, will be very happy with their progress in the first 10 games. You know, one sits in the top half, the other sit in the higher regions of the bottom half, all picked up points. It's positive from all of them, and even in defeat, I think Newcastle can take some positives. Burnley, though, continue to be one of the shocks of the season. They're up to seventh position with this win. Sean Dyche is doing an unbelievable job. It is no surprise he's being linked with some of the jobs that are available in the league. He's even been linked with West Ham and at this moment in time based on his record I actually wouldn't be too sad if we took him might not be the name that West Ham fans want but he might whip some of those prima donnas into shape because he ain't got any there he's just got a hard working bunch of lads and they're working for him and winning games for him a great result for Burnley so there you have it my friends that's week 10 of the Premier League all wrapped up for your viewing pleasure I do apologize again for the dogs barking in the background it is Halloween at the time of recording this Halloween is for dickheads. It's why do we celebrate in this country? No, not for me. But yeah, that's it, my friends. The Premier League preview will be up on Thursday. Make sure you tune in and watch that. It's bound to be a good one. But that's it, my friends. Until next time, I have been Dan. You have been legends. This has been the Premier League wrap up show. That's been my bog. That's one of the dogs barking. <laughs> Peace out, my homies. And I'll see you for the next one. <laughs>